Okay, Colossians chapter 2. Yesterday, we started in with, uh, in chapter 1, and we and I was sharing about that uh, miniseries, Roots, and Alex Haley, uh, how he went back five or more than five and uh, figured out his genealogy. Uh, and, and I shared that whole thing about the idea of Punta Quinte's father takes him out into the night and he names him on the eighth day and he lifts him up before heaven and he says, you are Punta Quinte, he names him, lets him know who he is. And he goes through the whole tribal uh, uh, scenario or ritual. He, he talks about the whole tribe uh, and his background. And then he says, behold, the only thing greater than yourself as he's gazing up into the heavens. And yesterday we talked about the whole idea in Colossians that Paul really is doing the same thing for us, the church, uh, the people of God. He wants us to know who we are, what our heritage is, where we come from, where we're heading, and the one thing in the universe that is most important for us to submit to and to be uh, uh, given to. And, uh, and so with that, we talked about uh, in chapter one, knowing our identity as an individual. If you don't know who you are in the Lord, and I'm not just talking about, well, I'm saved, spirit-filled, tongue-speaking believer. That doesn't. That doesn't tell anybody who you are. I'm talking about really getting with God and letting him speak to you. And we talked about that yesterday. Spending time with the Lord and let him speak to you, even during the course of this week. Let him speak to you about who you are, what he's put inside you, what he's called you to, what he has for you. Uh, you know, that all this Pentecostal jive is craziness, you know. Uh, just find out between you and God. Don't go with all the cliche stuff. And that's all, okay, I mean, we that's what we are. We're Pentecostal, tongue-speaking, messianic believers. And, and I'm proud of that. But that's not me. That's what we do. That's, that's a general identity. That doesn't help me in my relationship with one-on-one -on -one with God at all. And what we're interested in, what Paul is really interested in Colossians, is preparing the body. We're going to talk about this in a little bit. But Paul is sitting in, in Rome. He's in prison. He's in the maritime prison as he's writing this. He knows that hard, hard times have already started. The this, this scenario is very similar to where we're at today. Hard times have already started. It was written in about 64 AD. Uh, he's going to be martyred in 66. Okay. And so is Peter. And that's when Nero really pours on the persecution. So they're just coming into the persecution. Guys, that's where we're at today in the world. It's where we're at in America. And so we need to take Paul's teaching to heart and say, you know what? I need to get ready for whatever is coming. We don't know what's coming. We don't know if we're going to get another four-year reprieve. Or, or I personally think that the election of Donald Trump as president in 16 was a four-year reprieve for us. That's, that's my thought. Uh, if he gets elected again, uh, I think we're going to get another four years, uh, but I still think it's going to kind of start heading down. But after Donald Trump, let me tell you, there's going to be a socialist in the office, and he is not going to like you and I, or she, whoever it is. And so we need to prepare now. And that's what Paul is trying to do. So he says, I want you to learn who you are. I want you to learn the identity of your family. He's not talking about your individual family. Remember, the Lord prophesied very clearly. He said, in the end days, parents are going to turn in children, and children are going to turn in parents. So what do we be? Now, this is the Lord speaking. So what's he telling us? He's telling us, you can only count on your blood relations, your family, to a to a certain degree, some more than others, some less than others. 
but you got to know who's who, right? So which blood is thicker, your family blood or the blood of Messiah? He said the blood of Messiah is the thicker blood. Amen. And so that's what we need to rely on. Uh, that's what bonds us together. That's what unifies us as a people group. And then we talked about that idea that uh, the Lord said, if you love me, what, what do we do? We keep his commandments, right? So, but he says, love others as you love yourselves. So how are we going to define loving others? Because you don't have commandments I need to keep. So how am I going to, how's that going to be defined? Our love for one another. And we talked about 12 ways that we can pray for one another that will form a bond of oneness and unity and love. Okay, and we talked about that. And you can go over that in your notes. And, and I want to encourage you to be praying that uh, for your, your, the people in our congregations. We have, what, three congregations represented here this morning. Four. Okay, we got four. So, hallelujah. Yeah, We're growing. Better. Awesome. So, we want you to go home and pray that into your congregation and teach others to pray these things that Rabbi Shaul taught us to pray. Okay, and then we talked about the kingdom that we belong to and the awesomeness of that kingdom. We don't belong to the kingdom of the world, the earth. Uh, even America, America is so far from God. Uh, I mean, I, I love America. I'm a, I'm a real patriot, okay? But uh, America has, has turned from God, by and large. And how do I know that? I know that because we have uh, anti- Christ candidates running for public office and they're getting voted in and, in and they're in public office. And I'll tell you who's putting those people in is the church. If the church all band together and just voted principles and character, we could vote in any individual we wanted in this country. We could control this country. And yet we're not doing that. And that's, that's one of my pet peeves with the church. I, I don't know what the church is thinking. Well, I wouldn't even get into that. Okay. Okay. Onward and upward. Amen. So today what we want to do is, we and starting in, in chapter two, we're going to talk about in Roman numeral number one, four things that Shaul desires for the family. Four things Shaul desires for the family. Now remember, this isn't your individual family. Although it can apply, this is talking about the family of God, the ones that you're really going to need, the ones that you can really count on. And again, we talked yesterday, you have to discern who that is, because I'll tell you flat out, I don't trust everybody in the church. I don't even trust everybody in our own congregation. I love them. The Lord loves them, but I don't trust them. I've been stabbed in the back too many times. I know how it works. I know that these very people will turn you in for 20 pieces of silver. That's just how it is, guys. So you got to know who, who can you trust. And I'm not a paranoid person, but I do believe I'm a wise person in many ways. And so figure out now who you can trust. And this is what Paul uh, wants for us. This is what he wants us to develop in our lives. And by the way, let me say, this is a development. This doesn't just happen overnight. This doesn't just happen because you proclaim it. Okay? Very few things happen just because you proclaim it. This is a process. The theological word for that is sanctification. God does almost everything as a process. Even the healings in the Bible, the Greek word for healing that's used most often is therapeuo. What word do you suppose we get from that? Therapy. Therapy. Process. Guys, an instantaneous healing is not a healing. It's a miracle. A healing is a process. Don't despise the day of small beginnings, even in your healings. Oh, okay, well, 
we're going to hit more on that later as well. So I want you to turn to Colossians chapter 2. We're going to look at verse 1 through 3, and we're going to read from the New Living Translation. I already shared with you that this was just written just prior to intense persecution. Um, and, and Rabbi Shaul Paul is just trying to get the people of God encouraged and built up and ready to face whatever might be thrown at them. And I feel that that's where we're at as a country, and as a world. We need to be ready for whatever's thrown at us. And I personally think there's some bright things on the, on the future. I, I do. I think there's some great things right around the corner coming uh, in every realm of life. But I also know there's a move of the anti-Messiah and every year is moving closer. If you're familiar with Agenda 21, the UN Agenda for World Domination, well, they now, of course, amended it to Agenda 30 because they were a little bit behind schedule. Uh, but uh, one of the UN spokesmen just came and he said they have gained more ground in the last 10 months than in the last decade towards their agenda. The Agenda 30, Agenda 21, Agenda 30, is for the elimination of 95% of the world's population by the year 2030. Go right on the UN website and read it for yourself. This is their stated goal. So they want the world population to be right around 500 million people. So you figure it out. You do the math. This is where we're headed. Even our zoning laws and all that, they're all tied in with Agenda 21 and Agenda 30. Check it out. Don't believe a word I tell you. Check it out. This is what we're dealing with. Okay, so Colossians 2, 1 through 3 says this. He says, I want you to know how much I have agonized for you and for the church at Laodicea and for many other believers who have never met me personally. I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's serious plan, which is Messiah himself. In him lie hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All right, let's break that down a little bit, and uh, let's begin to look at it. He's, he's introducing this chapter by saying, this is what I want. That's, uh, that's the exact words he uses, okay? Now, it starts in letter A in your notes. He wants the people of God to be comforted and encouraged. Comforted and encouraged. Now, this is, a, this is a winning combination, and so many people need to be comforted um, and encouraged. I have a gift of encouragement. I can, I can talk somebody out of a pit fairly easily. I don't have the gift of comforting people. Because basically, out of the pit, I'm going to come down there, and we're going to have it out. <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen is the comforter. Uh, I, however, because I'm a man of God, I have to learn how to comfort God's people. Because this is a season when people need comfort. It's not. A, it's not enough to say, "Well, I'm the encourager, so I'm just going to tell you the way it is." I have to also be the person that says, "You know what? I know you're hurting." And, and I have a hard time relating to that because the honest truth is when I find myself in a pit, most of the time, with the Lord's help, I get myself out. I don't, I don't have to go to other people and tell them, and I don't need that pat on the back thing. I just have that. That's not a boastful statement. That's not even a great thing. It, it's, but that's, we're all different. Isn't that right? And so as the people of God, we've got to learn both of these traits. We need to learn how to comfort and how to encourage. I was just going to say, I think, I think one of the ways, I mean, 
God gave you a wife uh, to learn how to comfort, right? Because you had to learn how to comfort me because that wasn't your natural tendency. So, you know, that's how God's teaching you and through your children and grandchildren. So you have to carry that over yeah. into others' lives as well, right? Right. Kathleen says to me all the time, thank you, Solomon. Well, I don't anymore. <laughs> I used to. I used to. And that's my cue that I'm trying to fix it. And I'm a fix it kind of guy. You know, if you're broken, I want to fix it and get you moving on and, and back to work. Get back to work. You know what I mean? Um, and so when I'm trying to do that, it, that really isn't the godly way to do things. And in these days, I'm, you know, for me, the pandemic, the pandemic is nothing for me. Absolutely nothing. We haven't, we've gone out to eat every, all, well, we eat every meal out. And so we go to restaurants for every meal. It's what we do. We've, we've never stopped doing that during this pandemic. We've never stopped going into stores. We've never stopped mixing with people. None of that bothers us. But listen, there's a lot of people that it does bother. And we have to have that compassion because they have sincere issues. So it doesn't matter where you're at. It matters where God wants you to be. Make sense? Okay. So to be comforted and encouraged. Let me read that from the uh, complete Jewish Bible. It says, my purpose is that they may be encouraged, that they may be joined together in love, and that they may have all the riches derived from being assured of understanding and fully knowing God's secret truth, which is the Messiah. Okay? So, in letter B, he says, after you learn how to comfort and encourage, and you got to pray, Lord, what, what am I strong at? What am I weak at? Have a sober judgment, right? That's what Romans tells us, have a sober judgment. And uh, what does that mean? That means know your strengths, know your weaknesses. That's what it means. Okay? So after that, in letter B, we need to be knit together in love. Knit together in love. Now, I like the way the complete Jewish Bible and the New American Standard put this because it really qualifies why we need to be knit together. Okay? And let me just share with you. Remember yesterday we were talking about the giant sequoias, the redwoods. We were talking about deep roots, going deep with our roots. But then I shared with you uh, what I learned about redwoods. Redwoods, their roots do not go all that deep. How they gain their strength because of the height is the redwoods always grow in groves. You never see a redwood standing alone by itself. It's in a grove. And the reason for that is because the roots go down and then they spread out horizontally and they intertwine and knit together. And that becomes their strength. You know, deep roots can be pulled up. Years ago, I was at a conference with some of the guys from our congregation. We were in Nashville, Tennessee, and an F5 her, uh, tornado came through. Wow. It was the wildest thing. We had the afternoon off, so we were going over to, we were driving from the conference center over to the Hermitage, which was Andrew Jackson's uh, home. Uh, I'm a big historical nut, so uh, whenever I'm in an area where there's any kind of history, I make sure I leave time to go check that out. And uh, great. And there's the music to go along with it. I know. That is. <laughs> the Gary Owen, see? <laughs> What can I say? So, so we were going over to the Hermitage, and it was it was interesting because we were driving down the freeway, and the the radio came on with a, a real emergency broadcast. I'd never heard one in my life, 
And this tornado was literally following us down the freeway. It was like chasing us. It was going the same direction. <laughs> and then it turned off and it went in a different direction. So we went about our day and we went to the Hermitage. But we were there and uh, there was kids on field trips there. And uh, this hurricane then turned and came back and went right through the Hermitage wow. when we were there. And it was, it was wild because you could see it. I mean, you could see trees swirling. It was huge. It was, it was like that, that movie Twister. Yeah. It was the wildest thing. And it comes and it went, went right to the front yard of the Hermitage, lifted, went right over the building and sat down in the backyard. Wow. And uh, we were, we had chairs in the doors because the doors were being pulled off and we were holding the doors. Uh, the four guys from our congregation, there was 200 kids in there screaming and crying and carrying on. And uh, and we actually later got a commendation from the state for saving, rescuing the 200 kids. And so that was kind of neat. But afterwards, we went out and we had to, we had to saw the trees and get them out because you couldn't even get in or out of the hermitage because huge cypress trees were pulled up like carrots. I've got pictures of holes in the ground 20 feet deep where the roots were just pulled straight out. Wow. Pretty phenomenal. Other pictures where trees were split right in half lengthwise. This half of the tree was gone and this half was still standing. It was, it was the wildest thing. The point being, deep roots aren't enough necessarily. There can be a big enough storm to tear you away even with deep roots. What we need is roots that are intertwined. And that's what Paul's talking about here. Very important for us to start intertwining our roots with one another. Reminds Speak up the, so they can hear. It reminds me of the three strand cord. Oh yeah. yeah. Remember when Clint and yeah. I got married, we had that uh -huh. printed up on our wall. Oh yeah. That yeah. keeps the marriage strong is you have that third mm -hmm. cord and mm -hmm. it's wound together. That's right. That's right. I love that. That's exactly. Yeah, that's good. That's exactly right. The Lord. And we need even more than the three. Guys, look around at your life. Having the Lord in your life is not necessarily a foolproof way to go through whatever happens. How many believers do you know that once were strong and now they're not even walking with God? You need more than just the three strands. And if that wasn't true, what you're saying, if it wasn't true, then why would the enemy spend so much time trying to, that's why our theme is unity. Exactly. He's, what he's done Make is he's dismantled, right, right. The, admitted this. Yeah, uh, yeah. I remember Barb, yeah. you did the whole sweater thing. Remember that vision you had for yeah. our Zuko? Yeah, yeah. Interwoven sweater, right? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's got to be, uh, look at what's happening in, in, in our country and in the world. Uh, marriages are breaking down. So that intertwining is breaking. The family unit is almost gone. You know, when I was growing up, you used to see families driving in their cars with their kids in the back seat, and they were going somewhere. You never, when was the last time you saw any kid sitting in the back seat of a car that wasn't an infant or a real small toddler? You don't see teenagers riding with their parents anymore. With each other. They ride with each other. The family unit is all but broken. Look at our nation. We haven't been this divided since the American Civil War. I mean, we're so close now to a civil war. If you study history, you realize we're only one trigger pull away from a civil war right now. Only one trigger pull. That's scary. So that's the fabric of our nation has been torn. I, I was telling uh, Kathleen last night, I'd rather be with non-believers than liberals. Oh. I'm serious. I'd rather be with a non-believer than a liberal believer. I'm not saying it's good or bad or I'm, I'm not saying anything. I'm just telling you where I'm at. The division is so strong. We were going to have a family reunion this past year and we got some liberals in our, in our family and 
I told Kath, I said, I do not want to go. Because this is not going to be pretty. Because <laughs> I can only take about 30 seconds. Yeah. Speak up. Isn't the uh, term liberal believer, isn't that like an oxymoron? I don't see how you could be <laughs> a liberal and be a believer in Yeshua at the same time. Yeah, I don't, I don't. I don't think it's possible personally, but that's another, yeah. that's another issue. That's another message. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we need to be knit together. Okay. And why do we want to be knit together? The complete Jewish Bible says it this way. It says uh, that you may be joined together in love and that they may have all the riches derived from being assured of understanding and fully knowing God's secret truth, which is the Messiah. And then from the New American Standard, um, says that their hearts may be encouraged, having been knit together in love, and attaining, there's that process thing, attaining to all the wealth that comes from the full assurance of understanding, resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Messiah himself. When we come together in love and we're knit together in love, what Paul is telling us here is we are now attaining to the wealth that comes from the assurance that this brings. How many believers do you know that just are not, they're not even assured of the basics, like their salvation? Many believers, uh, and I'm not going to get into a thing on eternal security, but many believers think you can lose your salvation. So one day they're saved and the next day they're not saved. They're, they're not assured. They, they're they missing that assurance. I counsel believers all the time that they, they know without a doubt God loves you and he loves me, but they're not sure God loves them. You ever met people like that? Where's the assurance? Because it's that assurance that gives us the strength we need. It's that assurance that builds us up. And, and what Paul is saying here is that assurance is going to come through the love of the family knit together. This is crucial. I can't stress this. You are not an island unto yourself. This is not ever about me and God. This is about us and God. Remember yesterday we talked about the idea tribalism is coming back. You may remember the movie Braveheart. You know, I'm Scottish and uh, proud of that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we were McDowell's we, and we were part and parcel to the, Medu the McDougal clan. But in that movie, when war breaks out uh, between the Scots and Longshanks, that remember all those guys come running up at night and they don't know who they are. And they're ready to get into uh, a fray. And then they come up and they say, we're from such and such a clan. And then they were embraced. Right. Guys, that's, uh, clans are not denominations. Okay? <laughs> or they're, they're, they're actual families. Yes. Look, the Bible is very clear. Tribalism is the way God intended mankind to live. I mean, you can't argue with that. We're so far from tribalism in America, we don't even know how to spell the word, okay? But he's going to bring us back to that, I believe, tribalism. And part of that tribalism will be just where we're at, the Messianic, will be a tribe, I think. Now, uh, I don't know how that's all going to break down, but you're going to know who's included, and you're going to know who's an outsider. Okay, so we'll be knit together in love. All right, letter C. Why? So we can have full assurance and confidence. Because we need the assurance that the Lord is with us, that he won't leave, won't forsake us. We need the confidence that no weapon uh maid can come against us that the lord won't leave us he won't forsake us we need confidence that in messiah i can do anything 
we need the, this confidence and this assurance, okay? Because how many know we are, we are a minority, okay? We are a minority within the ranks of Christendom. Yeah, we are. Uh, a bit, and by the way, if you haven't noticed, most Christians, they don't really appreciate what you have to bring to the table. They don't think much of your faith, quite honestly. They think you've lost it, that you've given up on the, the tenets of, of the faith, so on and so forth, and they exclude you. When all the churches on the mountain do something, we, we're not included. They, they're not even sure we're believing Christians anymore. They're not, I've had pastors come to me and say, well, what do you do with Jesus? And I go, well, what do you mean, what do I do with Jesus? I worship. I follow him. But they don't get it. You're definitely a minority when it comes to society. And the church is, is not growing, guys. The church is shrinking at an alarming rate. Less than 2% of all millennials even attend church at all. The, uh, the faith is dying. Now, I realize God will always have his remnant. But, he's, but I personally believe the remnant, by the way, is tied in with the tithe. I believe the remnant is a 10% because it's 10% that belongs to the Lord. And I believe I can build a case for that, comparing the tithe with the remnant. So a 10% figure is not very many. He's out of a church of a hundred, only 10 would actually be part of the remnant. And then I think it's divided even further than that, because then I think the bride is actually taken out of the 10%. So you can see how the numbers start dwindling very quickly. So we need full assurance and confidence in the Lord. And, you know, I know we can quote the scriptures and stuff, but guys, the devil can quote the scriptures better than you and I put together. Being able to quote scripture is not the whole ticket. It's important. You need to know the scriptures. They need to be written on your heart. You need to be able to shoot them out there. But the scriptures have to be real. I'd rather have a hundred scriptures in me that are real than be able to quote a thousand, honestly. Doesn't that make sense? Because where we're going, it's gonna get very real. It's getting very real even now. So we need that assurance and that confidence. Um, and number one here under C, Colossians 2.2 uh, says of understanding. He wants the full assurance of understanding. And then he tells us what this is. He says the, the understanding re, is resulting in a true knowledge of God's mystery. That is Messiah himself. So the real mystery that we're looking at here. Now, yesterday we talked about the mystery of the body was what? The Gentiles didn't need to convert. To Judaism to be saved. The mystery was God was bringing Jews and Gentiles together as the one new man. But now we're talking on an individual level, okay, and what we're saying is he wants us to understand with assurance, and this is going to result in a true knowledge of the mystery of God for your life. Now, how many would say your life in many aspects is a mystery to even you? Isn't it? I mean, I don't pretend to know what God's doing in your life. I don't have a clue what he's doing in your life unless you tell me. I, and furthermore, I'm too busy trying to figure out what he's doing in my course. You've got to figure that out on your own. This is where it's you and God. It's not even your spouse and you. This is where it comes down this is where the rubber meets the road, and it's you and God. You've got to go out, get under one of these trees or whatever. 
ever sit down and spend time with God. And these mysteries started way together in your mother's womb, and he was talking to you. And what was he saying? He says, I know the plans that I have for you. See? And Jeremiah, who is, is the, the, the prophet that recorded both of those things, he starts it off by saying, the Lord wove me together in my mother's womb. And then he gets to verse, uh, chapter 29, and he says, and this is what the Lord was sharing, the plans that he had for me. Right? <laughs> so you've got to get with God and find out what this mystery is. You need full assurance. You need full assurance of what he wants to do in your life. And you might say, well, you know, I'm 60 years old, I'm 70 years old. Uh, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I understand that, we do care. But you know what? God didn't start working with Moses until he was 80. Abraham, yeah. Joshua. Yeah. I think one of the reasons for that is because, I mean, quite honestly, you just don't even have the maturity to do much of anything. Right? Still I'm still waiting for the maturity as well. But <laughs> compared to when I was 30, I'm like a wise old sage now. <laughs> right? I always joke around. I say, you don't even grow a brain till you're about 35. Look back and say, oh, was that thinking? I know. <laughs> and the, yeah, and you weren't thinking. That was the whole point. So, so we need to get the insurance and the confidence and the understanding that's going to result in that knowledge of that mystery that is in Messiah for you and I. How many want to do that? And, and that means you've got to... Uh, you got to be vulnerable to the Lord. He may show you things you don't really want to hear. You know, when the Lord called me to pastor, I didn't want to be pastor. I didn't want to be a pastor. And I didn't want to be a pastor because I, you know, I grew up in the bike circles. My, my father's mantra was people are no damn good. I mean, he drilled that into me like crazy. So I grew up believing that. And uh, then I came to faith. And now you got to love these people that are no good. <laughs> it, it's, it's a conflict. It's a problem. And, and of course, you, then I, I realized, well, my dad was wrong. The Bible's right. So which one do I have to start chasing after? No brainer, right? But remember, I was sharing. I was a. I'm, I'm a pilot. I wanted to fly with MAF. The closest I wanted to get to people was some people in the back seat of my airplane, and I could talk to the controller on the ground through the radio. I had no desire to be a public speaker, to be pastoring, and God said, "I didn't call you to be a mission aviation pilot." I want you to pastor people. I went, what? What? I mean, we used to like it when people used to pull up next to our motorcycles and they'd, take, they'd lock the doors on their car and take pictures of us. Oh, yeah. That was like, you know, your head just grew a few sizes larger. That was perfect for us. You know. We were antisocial in so many ways. God had other plans. So when you get close to God, he may show you some things that you weren't really thinking about. But once you, now I realize, you know what? I was made to pastor. It's who I am. Pastoring is not what we do. Pastoring is who we are. What a revelation that was. Make sense? Hey guys on Zoom, I can start to turn this way a little more because the sun is starting to shift and so are the seats. 
That's true. I've got the awning lowered here, but I got that four inch gap and that sun is right here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Number two in your notes, let's go over to Thessalonians 1 5. I'm going to read from New American Standard here. Thessalonians 1 5, 1 Thessalonians 1 5. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit. Just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. How many know the word of God is good for every, for any and all and every occasion? Oh, yes. Right. Situation. You know, as a as a true blue Pentecostal, when we used to read this scripture, really the the word that popped out the biggest to us was, but also in power. It was all about the power, right? <laughs> And so, so every time we would look at this, that's what came out. It didn't just come in word only, but there was power behind it, okay? Today, I want to ignore the word power because that's all is trying to get across to us here. And of course, I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I think it's an absolute necessity for us, and I believe we need more of it. However, we need more of some other things, too. And that's what Paul's addressing. So he says, our, our gospel did not come to you just in word only, but also in the power of the Holy Spirit with full conviction. There's that word again, full conviction. Just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. The gospel is not just get saved and let me heal some people so you can see the power. The gospel, the most important part of the gospel, in my opinion, is the change that took place in my life. And it wasn't healings. I've had several miraculous healings, and I thank God for them. But the real change that I'm so grateful for, so thankful for, that I think is the most awesome thing God's done in my life is my change of character. And some of you, when people listen to me, they go, well, you haven't changed that much. <laughs> no, I've changed a lot. <laughs> I'm not even close to the person I was 45 years, 48 years ago. Right? I thank God for that because that is nothing short of miraculous. We can all say that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. We all have our testimonies. I mean, when I was in the military, guys, I was so wasted on drugs, I couldn't even remember what my parents looked like. I was out there. And God took me. I wasn't looking for him, really. He took me and turned me into what I am today. That is nothing short of miraculous. And what he's done in my life, I want him to do in other people's lives. And for me, that's the single most important thing that's transpired in my life. And that's what Paul is talking about here when he's talking about the power, the power of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. He says, just as you know what kind of men we've proved to be among you, he's talking about character. I want to reflect, if I had to choose, now we, fortunately we don't have to choose between these, but if I had to choose between having the character of Messiah and the power, the miracle power of Messiah, I would choose the character. Which is the fruit. Which is the fruit. To me, the fruit is more valuable mm -hmm. than the gifts. The gifts. Yeah. And you got to understand, I'm full-blown Pentecostal. I love the gifts. I love to see people healed, but I love to see lives change. I, I would almost say that you really can't have true the true gifts manifested without the fruit. I, I mean, so. that doesn't make sense. I mean, yeah, you fake stuff like in the Bible, they did the and Pharaoh did stuff, but the real gifts of God 
you know, that yeah, comes kind of does make from, sense because you got to have that change yes. in your yeah. character, in your character for God to work with you. That's all God doing it anyway. Yeah. You know, it is. And it's all <laughs> awesome. But guys, we human beings can only focus on one spot at a time. That's how we're made. You know, if, if you're an owl, <laughs> yeah, well, I don't want to throw off the uh, connection. Oh, yes. Thank you. There we go. Of course, now I'll forget to turn it back on. <laughs> All right. What was I saying before? I was so rudely owl, interrupted. If you were an owl. If, if you were an owl. <laughs> You're listening. This is wonderful. If you were an owl, you could focus over here and over here at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, their eyes can do that. Now, don't you wish you were a bird brain? <laughs> We weren't built that way. If you were a fly, you can focus 360 degrees. That's why you can't sneak up on them. Because their their eye is a is a plethora of lenses. Bird brain, I know. I've, I've drawn them in. Don't offend them now because we're not under No, the I know. We're under the trees. Yes, I, was just thinking I love birdies. <laughs> so, but we can only focus on one thing at a time, and that's true even with, with everything in our life. You, even if you're multitasked, you, you focus here, but then you jump over here. All that means is you can switch gears pretty fast. But you can't focus on this and this paper at the same time. You can't do it. And so in our spiritual walk, you have to choose where to focus. This is part of the mystery you want to get from the Lord. You want to go to the Lord and say, okay, where do I need to focus? Because I can only focus in one place, right? So do I need to focus on uh, the, the gifts of the Spirit right now? Do I need to focus on the character of God right now? Do I need to focus on evangelism right now? Or studying the Hebrew or the Greek? Where do I need to put my focus and my energy and my attention? Now, everybody has a plan for your life. It's not just the Lord, guys. I, you probably noticed that. Everyone has a plan for your life. And most people are not bashful to tell you what it is. You got to stop listening to that. You've got to get with God. Say, well, the Lord didn't show me that. Because you're not going to answer to me. You're not going to answer to your spouse. You're going to answer to God. Now, that doesn't mean that people that are valuable in your life can't uh, interject thoughts and direction and things that you take. Because God can speak through people. Absolutely. But you need to know the difference. And I see so many believers tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine that comes along because they're, they're not grounded. They're, they don't have the, the assurance or the confidence that God has spoken to them about something. Right? People want to tell you, well, this is what's important. This is what's important. Look, let the Lord tell you what's important. I think he knows. I think he knows. And, and he knows because he knows where you're at. He knows what tomorrow's going to bring. He knows what you're going to be facing tomorrow. I don't know what you're facing tomorrow. I don't even know what I'm facing tomorrow. None of us do. <laughs> Nobody does. But the Lord does. So listen to him. Make sense? And this is what Paul is trying to tell us. This is where that strength comes from. When we intertwine and we just stand arm in arm and we're not beating each other up and trying to convince others that you got to think the way I think. That's true. You don't have to think the way I think. In our congregation, I don't teach doctrine. The reason I don't teach it, I don't care what you think. I don't care what you believe about doctrines. Why would I care? Yeshua never taught on doctrine. So why would I care? 
Yeshua taught on exactly what we're talking about today, character. Now that he cares about. Right? And it's important to know your doctrines and know why. But how the church is split 38,000 times over doctrinal issues. It's 38,000 Christian denominations worldwide, give or take. Why we split? We're not, we need to come together as one. That's the theme. Coming together as one, right? All right. First Thessalonians 1 5. So he says, for our gospel. So we need to have understanding, number two, of the gospel. In number three, I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 6, verse 11 from the New American Standard. Says, and we desire that each one of you will show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. What is the hope that God has instilled in you? What is that hope? That's a valid question of hope. So you want an understanding of the hope that's in you. How many know hope changes? Hope changes with circumstances. Hope is not static. Hope changes. So where are you at today? What, what has God placed in you? What are you hoping for? Right? And you've got to understand this. Let God instill that. When you, when you let God instill that, you know, when I first came in, when we first came in, we've been in the Messianic movement uh, for a number of years now. When we first came in, everyone was on my case about wearing seat seat. When are you going to put on the seat seat? Da, 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 da. Oh my gosh, it got old. Leave me alone. I said, I'll put on the seat seat when the Lord tells me. Well, he's already told you in his word. Well, He's probably told you a lot of things from the word too. Right? Let God speak to you. Because I would conclude my statement by, by saying, when I put the seat seat on, I will not take them off. Many of the people that were on my case no longer wear seat seat. And I don't hassle anybody about wearing seat seat. Yeah, you know, they're actually out of fellowship now. <laughs> they were so big on the seat seat. They should have been big on the godly character. They'd still be walking with God. Which is what the seat seat's there to remind you of. To remind you. Exactly. Apparently they it's didn't need to be reminded. You see what I'm saying though, guys? We focus on minors. Yeah. Yeah. Let's not do that. Do you think God is big enough to tell somebody when they need to start put, wearing seat seat? Yes. What about how we celebrate the holidays? Don't be telling people how they have to celebrate the holidays. I think this year is a perfect example of how God just shook it up and said, you know what, you're going to do it all different. <laughs> and it's all right. Do it the best you know how to do it. We're not doing half of what we've done normally. Is that okay? It's okay, guys. It's the best we've got. It's pretty good. If you just do your best, I personally think God is fairly pleased with that. Go, okay, the, the Lord is asking this and this. We can't really do this, and but we can do this. It's okay. Let's relax in these things. Let's grow together in love. Not in the superficial things that divide. Okay? Hebrews 6 says, and we desire each one of you will show the same diligence. And what, and what, what diligence are we talking about? Showing and revealing the character of Messiah so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. Now turn to Hebrews 10.22. From the New American Standard. Okay. 
1022 says, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. There's that coming near with full assurance again. And the full assurance of what? Full assurance of faith. It's not talking about supernatural faith here necessarily. Now it can be, and I know as a preacher, we take liberties all the time because we're trying to make a point, okay? But really, full assurance of faith, okay? The operative word there is assurance, not faith. Do you see that? Okay, so that's very important. Faith is a hard thing for believers to understand. I personally believe we've all had that experience. You know, when you when you know that you know that you know that God's going to do something. How many have ever had that experience? I mean, there's just no, you know it. You would bet your life on it. It's so clear to you. And then, and, and it comes to pass, you just had, you just moved in the gift of faith. That came upon you. You had it. You knew that you knew. But how many know most of the time, you don't know that you know? You're hoping. You're thinking. You're moving. You're, you're, this is the direction. And of course, people who don't understand what faith will come in and get in your case about it. But you need faith. So faith is the substance of hope. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. That's the very... Now, there's nothing wrong with knowing that you know. I like that, actually. That's all. I wish I, wish I had that on every single thing. But that's not what God's doing. Because if I had that on every single issue, I wouldn't seek God. I wouldn't need to. I know me. I get lazy. So oh, I already know this, this is going to happen. And I think that's why he Speak says, up. I think that's why he says we should ask for our daily bread because if he gave us everything all at once, we wouldn't go to him every day. Yeah, it's about relationship. It's right. about relationship. I have faith that God's going to feed me every day. I mean, I, I know that. Now, I also know in my experience, it's not steak every day. Right. I've, we've eaten plenty of Kraft macaroni and cheese and hot dogs. Not because we wanted to, but because we were in that particular situation. Did the Lord feed me? Of course he did. And I had faith that he was going to feed me. I just didn't have faith that he was going to feed me steak every day. And I didn't have faith for that because I don't think that's what he wanted to do. You, does that make sense? Yeah. I'm going to repeat your question because they won't get it. No, just a, another way of looking at faith. The thing that was the most uh, powerful uh, example of faith was um, our little Jimmy girl that came to Heidi for the video. And she was asking her father if she was her father for any faith. And he was saying, but she said, Yeah. God gives you the faith when you need it. That's the, and that's the gift of faith that comes when you need it. The rest of the time we're developing faith, which is the assurance and the confidence of things hoped for. Yeah, she was saying how Corey Tin Boom, uh, when she was getting on the bus, she was asking her father how, how, how did she know she had the faith she was going to need? And said, just give the ticket to the conductor, uh, step out, do what you need to do, and have the faith that it's going to be all right. And that's what we do. Even here, we come to Suco, uh, we just do what we can do. We step out with whatever mm -hmm. we can do. You know, when you pray for somebody that's sick, just pray. That's your part. You don't, guys, you don't heal anybody. What do you think? You're the, you think you're a healer? Come on, stop deceiving yourself. 
the responsibility is to pray. The responsibility is to pray. Let God heal. Now, is there gifts of healing? Of course there is. But all that really means is God uses that individual more than normal in that arena. Yes. I'm a teacher of the word. Anybody here can teach the word. But I have a gift of teaching, which means hopefully I can go a little deeper than most of you. I can explain it in a more understandable way. But you can teach. So somebody with the gifts of healing prays for the sick, and they have that anointing too. I've been prayed for many big names, the big guns, the really big guns. Nothing happened. Does that mean that God doesn't heal? That's not what it means. It just means they don't have the ability because they were pouring out blood, sweat, and tears over me. You know what I mean? God heals. Yes. And God heals even when you don't have faith. Which builds up your faith. I've received tremendous things from God when I, I didn't have the faith for it. I was hopeful and I knew I had the assurance. I knew that I knew that God wasn't going to kick me to the curb. But you know, we've gone through hard times. We lost our house uh, years ago in a BK. We bought the largest tent we could afford because we thought we were going to be homeless. Um, God came through, but we still lost our house. We've lost businesses, mm -hmm. businesses that we were, that I know to this day, God had a start <laughs> with Mike and Stephanie. We had a gym, a women's gym. It was beautiful too. Yeah. It was the best looking gym around. Yes, it is. We lost that. We lost four houses in 08. God, we've lost lots of things. Does that mean we don't have faith? No, it means I have faith to know that God's doing something else. What? I don't know. Plan B. I'm going to have to go out under the tree and find out what's plan B because I don't know. I thought we were still on plan A, right? Romans 5. Um, but the Romans 5, and uh, uh, Paul is saying, uh, let me see. What verse is it for our viewers? I'm start with, uh, actually, you can start with verse 1, and uh, through verse 5, even beyond that. Okay. Verse 1 through 5. Mm -hmm. Romans. So, Yeah. You know, we are more apt to understand and gain confidence and faith. Right. As we work through, you know, the troubles that we go through. Yeah. It doesn't mean that our life, the thick of it, you know, oftentimes as believers, once they think that except for the Lord, everything's going to be a rosy, you know, right. Pretty naive. Yes. Yeah. And, and that's when, actually, that's when it's only really begins. Because that's what he thinks. Yes, yes. Very true. Very good point. Romans 5 tells us, actually, in verse 3, it says not only this, but we exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance, proven character. There's that character. And proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint. Ah. See, everything's going back to that hope place. Right. And it's going to, and that hope is a hope that is proven character. See what I'm saying? So Paul is building this whole concept through all of his epistles. He's very big on this. Okay. 
I, I, could I just add to that? Um, what, that? Just what you're saying. I think that actually the greatest witness to the world is when we do have great loss or pain, but we boast in the Lord because they go, how can you do that? Why are you doing that when your life is falling apart? And that I think is what is the greatest witness really. Not when everything goes peachy, right? So. And I would have also have it blocked up and it's how he turns it for good. And at the time you're like, this is terrible. Later on, you go like that, it turned out good. Yes. And that's his word being fulfilled in our life because he turns all things for good. And we don't see it at the time. We don't even, we don't appreciate it. We don't even like it. We can even get upset with the Lord for allowing this. But all of these things are building proven character. Mm -hmm. And that's what Paul's talking about. Because in the end, we're going to need proven char character is what's going to cause you to stand. You're going to say, nope, this is who I am. And I'm not budging. And I don't care what the law or the government or the anti-Messiah says. I'm not budging. You know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I think they had tremendous faith. And yet they said, even if God doesn't deliver us, that wasn't lack of faith, guys. You kidding me? Do you have faith to go into the burning furnace? Show me. If you're such a faith guy, do it. Let me, let's put you in the middle of the campfire tonight. See how you do. No, see, they said, we're not going to renege on God. We're not going to turn our backs on God, even if he doesn't deliver me. Job said, even if he sends me to hell, I'm going to praise him. These weren't, these weren't faithless statements, guys. These were statements built on character, hope, which was their faith. Assurance. They had the assurance that even if they burned up in the fire, that was God. It was okay. They were yielded to that. That takes a character. That takes strong character to yield to something that you really aren't in favor of. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because you know it's the right thing. That's character. And guys, the church needs more character. Oh yeah. We need a lot more character than what we've got. Okay, I better move on here. I'm going to be in serious trouble. People are asking for number three and four. <laughs> well, three is hope. Number three is hope. Number four, I haven't gotten to. Uh, oh, it is faith. Oh, we did get to it. Thanks. We figured it out. Did you figure it out or did I talk about it? We figured it out. Okay, okay. So letter D now. Dan, these are the four things that Shaul desires for his family, is to understand God's mysterious plan. And again, that's the plan for our life. Turn over to Romans 11.33. 11.33. He says, oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible. It is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> you got to get with God. So first off, you don't have the mind. You're putting on the mind of Messiah, right? Has anybody got that all down yet? <laughs> okay. Working We're working on it. We're getting there. But it's, in my case, it's a fairly slow process. Okay, um, but we're putting on the mind of Messiah. We haven't arrived. I don't, not all my thoughts are his thoughts. I don't understand most of what he tells me and initially. I have to ponder it. How many do the same? I have, and I argue. It's a midrash. I mean, if Moshe argued with God, so can I, right? And we argue with God. Let's, let's, let down our spiritual fluff and let's get honest. Be honest. We argue with God. Uh, and it's okay. 
God has he has no problem with that really, which he typically does. One way or the other, he's going to win. Okay, but we need to understand his plan for us because when you just read the word, you know you can know a lot of different things. Um, just from reading his word, no doubt. I mean, you learn a lot about God from reading his word, but to personalize it, the tree. <laughs> back to the tree. Go back to the tree. You gotta go back to the tree. This is a general synopsis for everyone. Everyone falls under the scope of this, but for the individual life, God is doing different things in your life than he's doing in mine. Is he not? And he doesn't, nowhere in here have I ever seen, Bruce, this verse is for you. Mike, this verse is for you. Only. <laughs> I've never seen that. It's all for me in a general sense. And this is where the messianics get messed up a lot of times. It's all for us. Torah is, is for everyone. And yet there's a lot of Torah you can't do. There's a lot of Torah you're going to have to do differently than people living in Israel. It, it, it's just how it is. And that's okay. That's okay. Go into the tree. Get with God and go, how do I best do this for me and my family or for me? Right? And don't put your trip on somebody else. That's right. It, putting your trip on somebody else is not God. It may be sound for you. There was a season when I first came to the Lord, the Lord forbid me from having a beer. And, uh, Probably 10 years, I didn't have one beer. And then one day, I'm just standing in the bank in the line, waiting to get up to see the teller. And the Lord says, you can have a beer now. <laughs> like, like right this minute? <laughs> I, I didn't think he meant right this second or minute. But how many have ever had that kind of an experience? Where the Lord speaks to you, you're not even, you're not even thinking about that subject. And, and he speaks to you. Because really all he says about, you know, drinking is don't get drunk. In fact, for Sukkot, they could bring strong drink. <laughs> because this is according to Torah. Now, we don't, we don't encourage that. Like, don't, don't bring any Jack Daniels over here tonight or anything. <laughs> But but we'll go out to dinner, and from time to time, I'll have a beer with a steak. I don't get drunk anymore. I don't even, Maybe a glass of wine. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? So for those 10 years, I want to tell you something. That was God for me. God told me very clearly, you stop drinking, period. And I was not an alcoholic, guys. I was a druggie. I wasn't the alcohol, no. <laughs> Pastor Ben says, I love beer, root beer, A and W. <laughs> All right, me too. A and W. For me, for that 10 years, that was God's Torah to me. But that wasn't God's Torah to you. And it's not right for me to come and put my conviction on you. Now, if you're getting drunk, that's a different story. Because the word deals with that. You shouldn't be doing this. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah, we got to really watch that. Uh, because here, the reason I'm, I'm stressing this point is because Paul is trying to get us to come together and knit together. Right. Right. You will never knit together when somebody is hammering on you yes. about some porn ball thing. Holy yeah. The Holy Spirit is very capable of telling you what he wants. Yes. Oh, yes. In right. fact, the word says you don't even have to have a teacher. That's right. Now, that's not talking about teaching like we're doing here, because that's an office in the church. What it's talking about is under the tree. You don't need a teacher. 
go out under the tree and God will tell you everything you need individually. That's what that's talking about. You have no need as a teacher. You do need a teacher for certain applications. That's why it's part of the fivefold ministry. That's why a synagogue was built every time there was 10 Jewish men in a, in a city. You had to have a, home groups was not God's plan for the church. Otherwise he wouldn't have put, build a synagogue every time there's 10 men. He wants us to be celebrating together, not alone. Not just in your privacy of your own home with your family and your friends. It, that doesn't do much for us, guys. I always tell people when we're praying for people, pray for somebody you don't know, because then when you get a word, you know it's from God. It's harder. One, one of my strongest gifts is word of knowledge. It's harder for me to get a word of knowledge on somebody I know than somebody I don't know. Because when I know the person, I have to discern now, okay, I know this about this person. Is this God or not? And that's, it's hard to discern that. Mm -hmm. When you get a word for somebody you don't know, you just go, hey, this is what the Lord's showing me. Does this make sense to you? Yeah, they break out in tears. Yeah, oh, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and you know you've heard from the Lord. And they know you've heard from the Lord. When you go to somebody you know, they go, ah, you probably already knew that in one of our conversations. We just had breakfast together. We just had breakfast. <laughs> yeah. I mean, pray for people you don't know. Family members pray for their other family members. Guys, that's almost a waste of time. Why? Because the word tells us the prophet is without honor in his own house. Let somebody else pray for your family. They have the same Holy Spirit as you, right? In fact, when Kathleen, she was sick for 11 years with dizziness. I, I prayed every prayer. I, we did everything we knew to do. She wasn't getting healed. And it came to a place where when I had the church pray for her, I didn't even get in the prayer circle because I didn't have any faith for it. I could pray for other people. They get healed instantly. When I pray for her, nothing happens. So what did I do? I backed off. I stopped taking space in the, in the prayer circle. Let somebody else in there. Somebody that's gung-ho and raring to go, right? Okay. So to understand God's mysterious plan. All right. Roman numeral 2. So let's go back to Colossians 2.4. From the New Living Translation. 2.4 and 2.8. He says in four, I am telling you this so no one will deceive you with well-crafted arguments. This is exactly what we've been talking about this morning. People come in with, and I'm not saying they're not well-intentioned, okay? I, I think they can be very well-intentioned. But if I'd gone around for 10 years telling you, you cannot have a beer with your steak, I would have been totally out of line. And I would have put a trip on you that, that it wasn't God necessarily right does that make sense so uh well-crafted arguments you know when you know when you're a teacher you know a lot of scripture you know a lot of greek a lot of hebrew i'm telling you i've been i've been preaching for over 45 years I could turn to any scripture in the Bible and give you a message without any preparation. And it'd be a fairly decent message. Just because 40 years, that you do the same thing if you've been teaching for 40 years. It's just stored up in there. So what that means is if we, if we get into a hassle over scripture and I want to win my case and prove my point and convert you, I can probably at the very least, breed a whole lot of confusion in you. I may not convert you, but boy, I can give you an argument that is going to put you in a corner, probably. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And this is what this is talking about. Let no one deceive you with well-crafted arguments. And I wouldn't be trying to deceive you, obviously, but... If, I'm, if I get to the point where I'm trying to prove my case, prove my point, 
bring you to my way of thinking, uh, that's a well-crafted argument. I tell Kathleen all the time, if I hadn't gone into preaching, I would have loved to have been a lawyer because I kind of think that way. I'm pretty fast with my thoughts. And that's not always good in the kingdom of God. <laughs> in fact, that more often than not, that, that kind of goes south. Make sense? My version says plausible part. Plausible, good word. Yeah. Things are way out there, but this is awesome. Makes sense. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. And and yeah, he uh he was saying that in this scripture in two four Colossians, that instead of well crafted, his version is in uh in, in his uh, translation says plausible arguments. And people don't believe non plausible. So if you're trying to sway them, it has to be it has to sound convincing. So, I mean, even the devil does that, right? The devil doesn't come to you and just tell you wild, crazy things. He tells you things that are plausible that you will buy into. He into oh, he tweaks it. Yes, a drop of poison and a gallon of water and, it, and you're done for. And, and this is what this is talking about. And remember now, I'm not talking about different doctrinal stands and things, although that applies here. I'm just talking about just life, your walk with God. Your walk with God. Guys, I don't care what you think about the rapture. It, it doesn't matter to me. It doesn't matter to me what you think about the millennial reign. All that's going to happen when it happens according to God's plan. Period. I know what I believe. I know why I believe it. But you don't have to believe like me. I'm, I'm okay with that. Our eldership is divided on huge issues, like eternal security. That's fine with me. Some think you can lose your salvation and others don't. That's all right. That keeps us all honest, doesn't it? It's, it's a good balance. What I want to see, where we started today, is I want you to understand these deeper things between you and the Lord. Even though it's not all about you and the Lord, it's about us and the Lord. But if you're strong and our roots are interwoven, I will be strengthened by your roots. And where we're going, I need the people around me to be strong. Simple as that. That's what I want. It's what I want for Shiloh. It's what I want for the church at large. It's what I want for my family. Amen? All right. So, uh, and then jump down to verse 8, Colossians 2, 8 says, Don't let anyone capture you with empty philosophies and high-sounding nonsense that come from human thinking and from the spiritual powers of this world rather than from Messiah. Um, okay? So, in Roman numeral 2, don't allow yourself or other family members, and I'm talking about the congregations now, to be deceived. And then in letter A, verse 8, the word captive, that's your blank captive, letter A, the word captive is the, is the Greek word, Sologago, say that fast 10 times. To carry off as booty or plunder. Wow. Now that's, that's pretty interesting, isn't it? You know, the, the danger for believers is not that you're going to lose your salvation. I personally don't believe you can lose your salvation. I believe once you're a child of God, you're a child of God. I believe that my children are my children, no matter if they curse me, never speak to me, disown me, hate my guts, they're still my children. And it's the same thing with God. When we were inherit, when we were uh, uh, adopted. adopted, thanks, um, we became his children. And if you don't speak to him, then you, that, that's on you. You're still his child. 
you can go out and do all the sin you want to do. You're still his child. You're just a rebellious one. Uh, we all have rebellious children. We all have children. They're not so prodigals. prodigals. Let me, here's a, no extra charge for this. Most of the church are prodigals. Think about it. Most of the church are prodigals. That means we're away from the father. But they're still sons. The prodigal, the, the father had the prodigal son. He was eating the in the pig trough with the pigs. Still his son. Yeah, perhaps anyone who takes eternal security lightly should remember that we can lose everything except for salvation. Right. That's a very good point. And and that's my stand. Now and, and and again, if if somebody here believes in in you can you lose yourself, that's okay. I'm all right with that. That's fine. But you have more to lose than your salvation. <laughs> Do you not? Uh, right here it says we're taken captive. We're carried off as booty and plunder. We become POWs is what we become. Of their I mean, you know, Israel was always Israel, even when they were in Egypt, even when they were in Babylon, even when they were doing their so stupidness out in the desert, they were still Israel. Even when they're in New York City. Even in New York City. Even when God and Moses were arguing about whose people they were. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They were still God's people. It's, it, that's a funny conversation when you, you know, they're your people. No, I'm not taking responsibility. They're yours. What a what a scene that is. But they were still God's people. That's important to remember that. Because we're taken captive by these empty philosophies and these high sounding this high sounding nonsense filled with human thinking that says you've got to do it the way I do it. You don't have to do it the way I do it. That's okay. Get under the tree and figure out how you're supposed to do it. It's big enough. He talks to me. If he can get through to me, I know he can get through to you. Right? Number two, don't allow yourself or other family members to be deceived. And letter A under that is captive. Now, in Roman numeral number three, building your life in Messiah. Let's talk about this. Building your life in Messiah. This is what it's all about. You know what, guys? I asked personally, this is where we need to concentrate is on our character. No one wants to join the church today because the church really isn't much different than the world. What does the church have to offer that the world doesn't have? Not a lot. You say salvation, you say changed life, but then people look and they're, they're not so sure that that's even real. They're not impressed. What if we had the character of Messiah? Now I think people are going to sit up and take notice. People sit up and take notice of, of people that have high character. They're visible a mile away. You go, wow, that person is, is just different. Right? So I think that we need to build in Messiah. If every man, if every father here was the priest of his home, we wouldn't need pastors. The Lord knew that wasn't going to happen, so he made pastors one of the fivefold ministry. If every one of us went about our business reflecting the love and the concern of Messiah, we wouldn't need evangelists. Quite honestly, everyone would be an event, a real evangelist. People that people would see you coming, they would run to you. Now we have some of that, don't we? I mean, I don't know about you guys, but I know 
for me, when, when, for instance, my children have a problem, they don't necessarily pray about it for themselves. They're all believers. But you know what they do? They call us. How many have that same? They call us. Would you pray for me? My daughter has called me, and um, one of her friends was in a, a bad accident. Oh, no, her sister was in a bad accident, and she was with him. I said, put him on the call, and I'll pray for him. And he is, I think he's remembered that to this day. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure yeah. See, they see enough to know that who they need to call. But they don't see enough to want it for themselves. And that's on us. Right? So we just got to press into this character thing a little more aggressively, I think. I think this is the ticket for us. If we can press in and, and be concerned about the character of God. It, it's... You know, the Pentecostals press in to the power of God, the healing. The evangelist, everything's about evangelism. The messianic, everything's about keeping the Torah the right way. What if all those groups concern themselves not only with those issues, which are all important. What if we concern ourselves first and foremost with the character of God? I think we would change the face of Christianity. When we turned into the Messianic, I stood in front of the congregation. I said, that's our stated mission goal, is to change the face of Christianity in our generation. Now, whether we accomplish that or not, who knows? God knows that. But that's what, that's what I would like to do, change the face of Christianity. Because Christianity needs a facelift, quite honestly. It, it's a it, 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 uh, whole body lift. We need a plastic surgeon, right? A thousand years, and the Jews over 4,000 years. You know, let's be careful not just to follow the Jews because they're Jews. I mean, they've been strained twice as long as us. Make sense? Let's press into God. Let's grow in the character here. Okay. So building your life uh, in Messiah. Verse 6, Colossians 2 from the New Living Translation says this. And now, just as you accepted Yeshua HaMashiach as your Lord, you must continue to follow him. Let your roots grow down into him. And let your lives be built on him. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught, and you will overflow with thankfulness. Okay, so in letter A in your notes, three things that Paul teaches us from this a portion of Scripture. This is not a short-term adventure. This is a long-term life commitment. And, of course, commitment is the C word. It's a very nasty word in our society. No one wants to be committed. They don't want to be committed to a marriage, to a family, to a church, uh, and these days even their country. They don't want to be committed to anything. They're a bunch of loose cannons rolling around on the deck. And we don't need that. What we need is commitment. If, if you want to be like the Lord, you have to commit. Because he's committed to you. You cannot be a man or woman of God if you're not committed. You have to commit. So you go out under the tree and you find out where you're not committing yourself. Lord, show me. I mean, it's what the psalmist wrote, right? Search my heart, oh God. He's probably sitting under a tree somewhere. <laughs> Search my heart, oh God, and show me what wickedness and evil there is in me. You know, guys, when we pray that, most of us are not engaged in what I would call gross sins. If you've been walking with the Lord for any length of time, you've probably got a lot of that just taken care of. So what is this evil that's residing? It's all of this stuff we're talking about. 
Show me, Lord. Show me. So we need to continue to follow him. Unfortunately, so many people come in like fireworks and get all uh, crazy with the Lord. It's, it's, it's a worse witness than if they never come along. It's terrible. And you know what it does for the body? It tears the body to pieces and, and tears us up. It discourages us. It takes the wind out of our sails. When, when a family leaves your congregation, it's like the air has been sucked out of the room. Everyone's fighting to gain families and to grow. Because when they're, or if you just don't even show up, if you don't bother, to, you're not committed enough to show up. I always told my sports teams, the first rule in winning is you've got to show up. So even if you don't show up, you know what that does to those that showed up? It sucks the air out of the room. It, it can't be helped. It just does. So we've got to commit ourselves. You go, well, you know, I don't feel like doing that right now. Well, I don't think the Lord felt like going to the cross right then. Or beaten and flogged. He didn't feel like it. You kidding me? I do more things that I don't feel like doing than I do feel like doing, quite honestly. How about you? I mean, I'm just a straight shooter, guys. This is, this is who we are as people. We're wingnuts, remember? We're wingnuts. So commitment means you do things that you, you just wish you didn't have to do right then. Just go, you know, oh, I'm so tired. Do I have to do this? Have to wait one more little <laughs> right. I know. You know, you're laying there. We were, I was laying there in bed this morning. We laid there for 30 minutes after the alarm went off. And I thought, oh, do I have to get it up so I can wave a lulav? No, well, I didn't think that. I didn't think that. I thought I'd spin off that, though. It worked. But that was that was one of those well crafted uh, arguments. Uh. <laughs> Kath, everyone saw that. Kathleen is hitting me. Okay. Can, I, can I read a scripture here? We have a brother on. His name is Ephraim, and he said Psalm thirty seven four through five. Then you will delight yourself in Adonai, and he will give you your heart's desire. Yep. Commit your way to Adonai, trust in him, and he will act. Amen. Amen. Good scripture. Good scripture. 37, Psalm, Psalm 37, 4 and 5. Psalm 37, 4 and 5. Very good. And we're, we're actually getting to that. Oh. My brother there is a little quicker than I am. Okay. Very good. <laughs> All right. So building your life in Messiah. Okay. Now, letter A. You must continue to follow him. Letter B, let your roots grow deep. Remember, we talked about the redwoods. Talked about how those cypress trees in, uh, at, the, uh, at the hermitage at Andrew Jackson's house were literally ripped out of the ground like you pull a carrot up. It was the, and I mean, not one or two. This was lots of them. I'll bet there was 50 of those things. And there was, it would look like bomb craters 15, 20 feet deep. That wind just stuck that thing right out of the ground. So, guys, we have a formidable enemy. And we don't need just deep roots. We need roots that go deep, yes, but also go out and intermesh with one another. You, if you're going to be strong in the faith, you've got to you've got to be engaged with other believers. You've got to be intertwined, or you will end up getting ripped out at some point because the wind is growing. Okay. And then in letter C, build on Yeshua. What would Yeshua do? We've talked about this before. How would Yeshua keep the festivals? Mm -hmm. How did he keep the festivals? How did he keep the Shabbat? I mean, he had everybody mad at him, so he wasn't doing the old standard. 
He just wasn't. He was doing it differently. Okay, so how would Yeshua do it? Build on Yeshua. He's our, he's our rabbi, right? Very important. And I'm not saying all tradition is bad. I'm not saying that. A lot of tradition is good. A lot of Christian tradition is good. A lot of Jewish tradition is good. But it's only good if it lines, aligns itself with Yeshua. Otherwise, it's just tradition. And again, some traditions are good. Some are bad. You don't want to do those ones. And some are neutral. They just don't matter. We light the candles on Friday night. Nowhere in the Word are we commanded to light candles on Friday night. But it's a neutral thing. It doesn't matter if you do or don't. If you do, it has special meaning. And if you don't, that's fine too. But there's no commandment to do it. Right? So that's, in, that's what I would consider to be a neutral kind of a command. And, and so you can take it, you can leave it, you can change it up, you can not do it, whatever. Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the statement was uh, when you're, you're dealing with a Jewish person, lighting the candles now connects with them. This is what Paul was saying when he said, be all things to all people. So we used to do praise in the park right over that fence in, in the city park every month. And we had a lot of Jewish people come out and they would always say to me, how come you're wearing seat seat? You're a Gentile. I said, well, because it says so right here, you know, I, and I go, and they go, wow. And then we would start talking. Yeah, we keep the festivals. Really? Why do you keep the festivals? And, but now when you're witnessing to a Christian, I don't witness to a Christian and say they, you know, you should be wearing your seat seat. Right. right. You become all things to them as well. Mm -hmm. Why did you know that the word talks about the blue strand? Where's that? And you show them. You become all things to all men. We've got to have that flexibility. You, it, as soon as you get stiff, you're no longer a new wine skin. You, you've got to be flexible, guys. Uh, it's just how it is. And that, and that means getting under the tree with God. That's what it means. <laughs> I didn't realize we were going to be going to the trees today, but uh, <laughs> thing is in it. Okay, Roman numeral four. How am I doing on time? Fifteen minutes. I'm in trouble. Okay, Roman numeral four. Let's talk about the fullness of believers and Gentile inclusion in Messiah. This was a huge issue, and this was this was the main issue for Paul in his writings. His writings, most of his epistles were letters of correction. Does everybody realize that? They were letters of correction. He was there uh, correcting the congregations on what they were doing uh, that was kind of out of place and not completely correct. And one of the things that he was continually uh, struggling with and, and trying to promote was this inclusion of Gentile believers without going through the conversion process first. Up to that point, Jews knew that the Gentiles could get saved, but the only way, the only path that there was up to the time of, of and, and actually Paul was you had to convert to Judaism first. Then you could be saved. And, and it's just like our path to salvation in, in the Christian church is by and large the four spiritual laws. The sinner's prayer, which is not even in the Bible, right? The concept is there, but the prayer is not there. But that's the main path we use to bring people to faith in, in the Lord. And, it, and it's a good path. It works. It's, it's fine. But it's not the only way. I, I never said the sinner's prayer. Uh, I just started, I was reading all Hal Lindsey's books, and I just started believing what he was saying. 
and I became a believer. Uh, so the sinner's prayer is not mandatory for being saved. It's a good tool. So in the church in this day and in the synagogue, the understanding was you still had to become Jewish. So all these Gentiles that were coming to faith had to become Jewish first. And Paul's saying, no, absolutely not. They don't have to become Jewish. They don't have to, con well, you, first off, you can't become Jewish biologically. The, I should say convert. They didn't have to convert to Judaism before receiving salvation. And it was a huge argument in the, in the church at that time. So Paul is addressing that, and he's still addressing that even here to the Colossians. So his, his, his two main themes are the Gentiles don't have to convert, and you need to just worry about your character, by and large, is the most important thing. So the fullness of believers and Gentile inclusion in Messiah, let's look at Colossians 2, 9 through 15 from the New Living Translation. It says, uh, for in Christ lives all the fullness of God in a human body. So you also are complete through your union with Messiah, who is the head over every ruler and authority. When you came to Messiah, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. Messiah performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with Messiah when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted, because you trusted the mighty power of God and raised Messiah from the dead. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not cut away. Then God made you alive with Messiah for he forgave all your sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities and shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Okay, so what we see here is this. In letter uh, A here, um, let me read this from the Amplified for a moment. Um, 2, 9, and 10 from the Amplified says this. For in him the whole fullness of deity, the Godhead, continues to dwell in bodily form, giving complete expression of the divine nature. And you are in him made full and having come to fullness of life. In Christ, you too are filled with the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and reach full spiritual stature. And he, has, he is at the head of all rule and authority of every angelic principality and power. Okay? So, in letter A in your notes, just as Messiah is filled, so are you. Now, this is important because uh, he's speaking to a congregation that is probably mostly Gentile by this time. The church at large is mostly Gentile by the year 64, uh, just because Gentiles are such a higher percentage of the population than Jewish people. Okay, so he's speaking to congregations that are mixed, some Jews, some Gentiles probably mostly Gentiles, very similar to what we experience today in the Messianic. By and large, the Messianic movement is a Gentile movement, here in America at least. And we have more Gentiles than, than Jews, okay? So, he's saying you need to be filled just as Messiah was filled, okay? Now, I'm not going to go into that so much because it's a little bit off topic for us today, but I do want to drop down to letter B. And in letter B, Gentiles believers are identified by the same elements that identified converts to Judaism. And he addresses this right here in this, uh, in this portion of scripture that we just read in 2, 9 and 10, or 2, 11 and 10, 11 and 12 rather, uh, from the New Living Translation. In Paul's day, there was three elements that were, were required for a Gentile to convert to Judaism. Those three elements were circumcision for the men, immersion, they had to be immersed in the Jewish form of immersion or baptism, and they had to offer a sacrifice. So what Paul has brought up here in Colossians 2, 10, and 11, or excuse me, 11 and 12, he says, when you came to Messiah, speaking predominantly to Gentiles, you were circumcised. 
but not by a physical procedure. Christ performed a spiritual circumcision, the cutting away of your sinful nature. So Paul is relating this, the circumcision of the heart to the cutting away of the sinful nature. Okay? That's what he's referring to here. And then he says in 12, and you were buried with Messiah when you were baptized. That's the immersion. So he's saying to the, and, and of course, and then, and with him you were raised to new life. So Messiah was uh, slaughtered for our transgressions. So here we see the three fulfillments of conversion all in these two verses. So he's saying to the, the Gentile believers at, at the Church of Colossus, he's saying, you don't have to convert to Judaism. It's all, you've, you've done the whole three things already. You've, you've got the circumcision, you've been baptized, and you were buried with Messiah in his death and his resurrection, in his sacrifice for you. So see, he's once again bringing this argument back in. This is important for us to understand. You, Gentiles are, are just as important in the kingdom as Jews. We are the one new man. In fact, at Shiloh, we, we consider ourselves more as a one new man congregation than we do as a, as a messianic congregation. Even in our worship. We do half and half Christian and Messianic music, typically. There's a reason for that. In our congregation, you'll find some people wearing kippahs, some others not. Some wear tallit, some don't. Uh, it's because we're reflecting who we are there. At Shiloh, we know to whom we belong. We belong to him. We talked about this yesterday. And we're so secure in that that we don't feel you have to do all of these things to be a messianic one new man congregation. Okay. Now other churches are a lot more like we're, we're Shiloh is not a real liturgical messianic congregation. We don't do a lot of liturgy and, and we do the liturgy that we feel is important for both the Jew and the Gentile. Cause again, we're mostly Gentiles. Our congregation is displaced Christians, by and large. Yes. I mean, that's we have Jewish people, but even they were Christians before they came to Shiloh, by and large. We've had some people get saved in our congregation, but uh, evangelism has not been one of our big thrusts. In fact, it's really not a huge thrust in the Messianic period. But I just shared with the elders just two weeks ago at our meeting, Right after Sukkah, we've got four things that we're going to start emphasizing in our congregation that have to be built up. Evangelism is one of those things. We need to start getting out and evangelizing and getting the word out to both the lost and the Christian church and the Jew in the synagogue. So we've got to be all things to all three of those groups. That's not an easy assignment. It's a flexible assignment. So we've got to be flexible if we're going to reach all three of those groups. It makes sense. We can't be just rock solid in any of them. Now, that's our vision. Your congregation may be different. That's fine because God's doing something different with each person, with each congregation. That's okay. But for Shiloh, this is where we're at. This is what God has us doing at least in the foreseeable future all right what was the on b the third the other second way b was gentile believers are identified by the same three elements that identified converts to judaism and that was one two and three is circumcision is number one immersion number two and number three was sacrifice Thank you. you're welcome okay now Let's jump over to Colossians 2.16 through 23. I'm going to wrap this thing up here. Verse 16 says, So don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink. Now, this is going to go back to what Paul was saying a little bit earlier about putting trips on people. Don't put your trip on other people. Make sense? Don't put your conviction on other people. 
you, you're free to share your conviction, but if we're gonna have a strong root system, you can't be laying the ax to the root. You can't be condemning your brothers for things that just are not probably that important. Now, for instance, in the Messianic, we do want to tell people we need to be keeping the festivals. We know that. that that's from the scripture. But how you keep it, it really doesn't tell you. I mean, no, you don't have to have a suit coat with palm branches on the on the, the lid. If you want, that's awesome if that's what you want. But but, but you don't have to have a suit coat that's built that way. So don't put that on somebody. Don't say, well, my suka is better than yours because I have the palm branches. Let no man boast. Let no man boast. And this is what Paul's saying here. He's saying, let's, let's major on majors, minor on the minors. In fact, we'd be better off if we forget about the minors altogether. And don't, don't get in people's uh, space about it. it. It just, it doesn't breed what Paul wants us to breed here. Amen? There's that call of the wild. <laughs> oh, yeah, now that's sweet there. Well, I'm not getting an electric bike. Are you out of your mind? I tried that. Oh, well, you know. It's between him and God, really. Just assaulted our tree. They go to the tree. Uh, yeah, I know. All right. The tree told me. <laughs> I didn't say the Lord, I said the tree. <laughs> All right, let's move on before I totally get in the flesh. Good idea. So don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink, uh, or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moons or ceremonies or Sabbaths. For these rules are on, only shadows. Now, that word only there, I do not like. That is not good, and in, in the better translations, it's not there. In the better translations, it'll read, for these rules are shadows. That's, a minus. That's, a minus. That's the better translation. I'm mere using the new living here. Come. They're not mere shadows. They're not only shadows. They are shadows. And, there's a, and the reason I'm stressing that is because when you say only shadows or merely, it, it degrades it to a place where it's not as important. Yeah. When it says they are shadows, that means there's a real substance that's casting the shadow. Shadow caster. It yeah, says, it's a shadow caster. And it says the substance is of Christ. But the substance yes, is of Christ. But the substance, and my, uh, in the, the, uh, the New Living Translation says, and Christ himself is that reality. Okay, yeah. same, same idea. Yeah, don't let, verse 18, don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial or the worship of angels, saying that uh, they have had visions about these things. Their sinful minds have made them proud. And boy, there's a, there's a big one, isn't it? We've got to, that could mean some repentance for some folks. And they are not connected to, to Messiah, the head of the body, for he holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments, and it grows as God nourishes it. You have died with Messiah, and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep on following the rules of the world, such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch? Such rules are mere human teachings and about things that deteriorate as we use them. These rules may seem wise because they require strong devotion, pious self-denial, and severe bodily discipline, but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. Isn't that rich? Gosh, that, what version is that? That's a New Living Translation. Oh, man. Let me read that again because it's... And this is why I pick different translations when I read it, because there's one point, perhaps, that they really capture. How many know there's no actual literal word-for-word -word translation? It's not possible. In translation, you translate thought for thought, not word-for-word. -word. So there is no perfect translation. Some are better than others. As you know, I, I personally feel the, the New American Standard is the best translation on the market. Uh, and, and that's what I study from, 
but when I'm reading, I want to capture certain things that have just the right, they say it right. Sometimes the Message Bible just says it right. You know what I mean? So don't get hung up. It doesn't have to be King James <laughs> to be God. Yeah, that's the authorized version. You're right. I know. So let me read 23 again to you. These rules may seem wise because they require strong discipline. We get fooled by those things, don't we? We think when there's strong devotion, highest self-denial and severe bodily discipline, it must be God. I don't know why we think that. Do you realize the Muslims have all of those things? And they've got a faith to back it up. They fly airplanes into buildings and kill their children. Guys, these, these people have faith. Don't, don't think otherwise. They have a strong faith. The problem is but they provide no help in conquering a person's evil desires. See? So we don't want to get caught up in this either. This is the danger in the Messianic. Because we're going after Torah, which we need to be. In the, in the church, we got, we got so far away from Torah, we didn't even know it existed. Then when the pendulum swings back, we come back, and the tendency often is to go too far. We're, we're, we're people that love to swing on the pendulum. I mean, it's just who we are. But we have to understand that just because it appears pious or strong devotion or severe bodily discipline, it doesn't necessarily mean it's dealing with your evil desires and your character. You know, when, when we were... A, uh, younger congregation, I used to, well, when we were a younger congregation, we did 24 hour prayer and fasting once a month. We prayed for 24 hours all night long. And uh, we did that once a month. Every four weeks comes around pretty fast. We've probably done a half a dozen 40 day fasts through the years. And I want to tell you something, something I've learned. The fasts in the Bible are like one day or so. 40 days of fasting, I'm not sure brought any real spiritual benefit to me. Now, don't hear me wrong, because fasting is a good discipline. But I think pushing it that far becomes more flesh than it does than it is spirit sometimes. I'm just speaking for myself. When we like to say, well, I'm, I, I'm fasting for 40 days, or I fasted for 40 days. Who cares? Who cares? What you want to do is go out under the tree Come on, I was just gonna say that. Yeah. and let God tell you when to fast and how long to fast for. I'm really at the point now, I don't fast a whole lot anymore. Of course, it shows, but. Uh, <laughs> no, I know. I don't fast too much anymore uh, just because I haven't felt the Lord's leading on it. But it got to the place where I would fast. The Lord didn't even tell me why I was fasting for the first two or three days. I said, well, I'm fasting. Why? I'm not sure. Now, that kind of seems like a waste of time, doesn't it? But if the Lord tells you to fast, then you fast. If he tells you why you're fasting, then he tells you why. If he doesn't tell you why, he doesn't tell you. What's that to you? The obedience is fast. How long? I'll let you know when you're at the end. That's what, I mean, that's what he said to Abraham, right? Go on a journey. I'll tell you when you get there. So, Guys, the tree. Remember the tree from today. Yesterday, you remembered Kunta Kinte. Today, you're remembering the tree. Very important. The tree of life. The tree of life. That's a good tree to be under. Tree of life. Spend time under the tree. Get this stuff from God. You can't get this from a pastor. The pastor's not going to tell you how long you have to fast for. I don't know. I don't know when you need to fast. Do I think it's beneficial? Sometimes. Sometimes I'm not so sure. That's got to be on you. Does that make sense? 
It's not up to somebody else to tell you these things. And that's what Paul's telling us here. He says, these things, don't let anyone condemn you because you're eating or drinking or not celebrating certain holy days or new moons, ceremonies, or Sabbaths the way they do it. Get with God. Because he's the one you're going to answer to. Um, one understanding that I've had over the years, kind of switching around a little bit, okay. that that he he's telling them, don't let anybody condemn you because you are doing this. For example, in you know we have a lot of ridiculous things right. doing. You know? right. My understanding is that yeah. what he's saying is don't be condemned because yes. you are doing yes. this, because you are eating kosher. Exactly. Yeah. Eating this. Yeah, and, and the statement for our viewers was uh, the uh, one of the uh, other alternate ways to view this, which I personally think is the more uh, contextual side. It's just I'm not teaching that today. Right. Um, is that don't let anybody else condemn you for doing these things. You don't eat pork. Most of us don't eat pork. We don't eat unclean. And people, people in your family don't like that. I mean, it's, it's not even a question of they, you do whatever you want to do. They, they don't like it. So, uh, so don't let that, uh, bring a conviction or you know you do the new moon and they think you're like a heathen out there with war paint on uh dancing around doing some crazy thing uh you know and i believe that is the the correct con contextual uh side of this scripture but i wanted to point out the the idea of uh getting under that tree that's my emphasis for today that, that's the beauty of the word. I mean, you know, next week I could teach this and teach something completely different. It wouldn't negate what I'm teaching here, but it'd be totally different. A different layer. Question. Through the whole teaching, we do have a couple questions, and I started writing them down, but I don't know if I got all of them. Um, but you actually have to write questions in the book. Yeah. Because it's not just a teaching. Like one of them was, where does the Lord want you to focus? No, I just threw that oh, out. Threw okay. Yeah, let me give you these answers on five. I'm not worried about them. Let, let no one disqualify you. Um, that's quite a statement, isn't it? Disqualify. How many know that if you go into the tree and the Lord tells you to do something or not to do something and you do the contrary, how many know you're in sin? Yes. You're disqualified for the moment, right? You're, you're disqualified in that arena. He's not going to kick you to the curb. He's not done with you. He's not even necessarily that mad at you. It's like you with your children when they're, they don't do what you ask them to do. You're a little uptight, but you want them just to learn the lesson, basically, is the main thought. So, but let no one disqualify you. If you focus on these things, you, you literally disqualify yourself from ever going out under the tree. You disqualify yourself and you, it's like our brother brought up earlier. It's not so much a question of losing your salvation. It's a question of losing the benefits of salvation the benefits of godly character the benefits of spending time under the tree you lose those and and once they're lost you can't get them back you have to make a new visit to the tree right so i think it's it's important to understand so let no one disqualify you um and and to disqualify from what well we we go back up into that ties right in with verse two, where he started. He says, I want them to be encouraged and knit together by strong ties of love. I want them to have complete confidence that they understand God's mysterious <coughs> plan for their life, which is in the Messiah himself. This is what you disqualify yourself. If you get tied up in rules and regulations and legalisms, you end up disqualified from understanding God's mysterious plan and truth for you. 
It's one of the fastest ways to do it. Get tied up as an old wineskin in traditions and things that God isn't leading. Okay? And then in letter A, the Spirit himself will teach you. I touched on this earlier. Guys, you don't need a pastor to teach you these deeper things. You need to go out under the tree. The pastors don't teach those kinds of, of individual one-on-one -on -one insight and knowledge. We can't. The Spirit has to do that one-on-one -on -one with you. On the back of your sheet, you notice a whole sheet. Now we can start these. <laughs> oh, you guys. You guys will look at me like, what? This. this some of them don't because oh you don't we copied sorry it. yeah it's okay oh, yeah, just, copy the bag. that yeah, just means you don't need it it was homework <laughs> homework you've already arrived barbara you're, you're in good shape it's just a breakdown of colossians it's it's a breakdown of colossians 32 points on uh just in colossians on what it means uh to uh to um build your life on yeshua i just didn't have time to touch on that today but if you want to remember we had in uh uh roman numeral 3c build on yeshua these 32 points are this is how you build your life on yeshua okay according to colossians these are just scriptures from colossians okay and guys that's our message hang for on, hang oh on. hang on okay first of all Oh, yes, the prayer after. And then uh, tonight, tonight, everybody know about 7.15, maybe right after a little praise and worship. Okay, tonight, 7.15, Barbara Hume's going to be bringing forth a Zoom teaching. What's it on? Uh, how the churches in Revelation apply to us today. Oh, how the churches in Revelation apply to us today. That's interesting because Deanna's doing a message of teaching on the churches up the mountain. So very interesting. So it'll be right after the praise and worship, which won't be great on Zoom. Yeah, so, so it'll be right after our praise and worship, which uh, we all know really stinks on Zoom. But, <laughs> but we're going to do it anyway. So tune in around 7, 7.15, okay? So let's uh, end with the prayer. Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan lanu terari met, behaye olam nata bukatenu. Baruch atah Adonai noten ha Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who gave us the Torah of truth and planted eternal life within us. Blessed are you, Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks for tuning in, and uh, have a great Sukkot. Have a great day.